Welcome to Fabulous Women Over 40, hosted by celebrity stylist Kara Allen. Join Kara as she interviews amazing women, sometimes younger and amazing men as well, in their 40s and beyond. Here's Kara with our Fabulous Woman of the Day. Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to another inspiring episode of the Fabulous Women Over 40 podcast. I'm your host, Kara Allen, personal stylist and branding expert with over 20 years of experience in helping men and women create powerful presences through their appearance. This podcast is dedicated to celebrating the incredible women and men over 40 and sometimes under who are redefining what it means to be fabulous at any age. My guest today is Kim Andes, pronounced Addis. 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 Okay. It looks like Andes, but okay. <laughs> is the powerhouse president and founder of Frame of Mind Coaching and Journal Engine. A trailblazer in leading leadership coaching and thought mastery, Kim's unique philosophy and dynamic coaching style empowers leaders to transform their mindset and achieve extraordinary results. An author, speaker, entrepreneur, coach, and mom of five, Kim is passionate about sharing her impactful co coaching business with leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs around the globe. Thank you, Kim, for being with me today. How are you? I'm great, and I'm super happy to be here. Great. So why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Like, where did you grow up? Did you have siblings? Like, what, what part of the world are you from? And how was your, how was your growing up like? Yeah, so Canadian. I grew up in Montreal. Okay. I have two siblings, and I came 13 years after my brother. Wow. For a long time, I used to call myself a mistake. Until Aww. somebody told me, don't say that. Mm -mm. And so now I say I was the pleasant surprise. Yes. Um, yeah, I grew up, I grew up in Montreal and ended up moving out to go to university when I was 18 mm -hmm. and kind of never looked back, ended up uh, living in Toronto. Now I am married. I have five kids and um, they're old now. So, <laughs> you know, they're adults. All of them are adults. But uh I've had a journey. <sighs> yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. So what was the most challenging part of your childhood? I mean, you said you grew up in in Canada, which you're my first Canadian guest, or maybe my second, I think. So it's interesting to hear from across the, I won't even say the pond, because that's more like, um, what do you call it? Like Service UK, <laughs> but like where, what was it like growing up in Canada? Uh, I mean, it was... I don't think anything unique or special. Obviously we learned to speak French when we were kids. Yes. Um, my parents were awesome. Both of them. Mm -hmm. They were very um, in, in a way, very attentive, but also very much role models. Like my mom worked, she was, became a bank manager when I was young, my dad owned a business. So I had exposure to leadership and entrepreneurship at a very young age. And mm -hmm. Um, they were very, very family oriented. So, mm -hmm. you know, we ate dinner together every night. We did things together on the weekend. It was just, you know, it was a very, very family oriented childhood all the way till I left. Okay. And so did you know when you were a child that you had a particular talent or you were reaching towards a, or were drawn towards a certain area of you know, what you do now, or I'll, I'll tell you a story. And I think it's an interesting story. But, you know, in Montreal, when you go to school, you go to school till grade six, like that's elementary school. Mm -hmm. And then and then it's high school. Oh. High school is grade seven till grade 11. Right. And so when you're in grade seven, you're in a new school, you're the, you know, the little kid on the block. Mm -hmm. And um, how it worked was, when at lunchtime, you would have your lunch, and then my school was a big circle. So you would walk around the circle with your friends. That's, <laughs> that's what you did. That was lunch. Interesting. Um, so one day I was walking around the circle with a friend and I saw this other student who was older than me. And mm -hmm. she was very tall, very, very thin. She was like jean jacket, kind of torn jeans. Um, she had long, very, very thin, thin hair. And she had a missing tooth. And she was like, had a cigarette in her hands. <laughs> so she was cool. Sounds like. I don't know if she was cool, but I came from like a very, very 
you could say protective background. I was not exposed to any of this kind of thing. And so when she came, I like, I looked at her and maybe I stared at her. All right. Like I was just like, never saw anything like that. Like, keep in mind, I was literally 11 years old. Right. So, um, I, I, I kind of like watched her as she was passing by and she caught me looking at her. And so she stopped me and she said, what are you looking at? And she put me up against the wall and she wanted to beat me up. And there were like a million people surrounding us. And like, I'm not the fighting type, you know, I didn't, I didn't look at her because I wanted to get into a fight. I looked at her because she was interesting and unique, right? Like I I just never saw anything like that before. And so I was like, Hey, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't mean anything by it. I, you know, I didn't even know what to say. I just knew that I wasn't about to go into the parking lot and get into a big fight. Right. Eventually a teacher came, the teacher broke things up and I'm like, I apologized. I'm sorry. Anyway, this girl's name was Shelly. Mm -hmm. And for the next four years, five years of my high school life, I dreamt about Shelly. And let me tell you about this dream, a recurring dream that I had. So the dream was we were on a roller coaster together. We're in the same seat together, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. in the same bucket or whatever right. together. And the con- and I would have a conversation with Shelly about how she could turn her life around and how she didn't need to resort to fighting and violence and, <laughs> and smoking in order to, you know, live a good, happy life. Right. So that was the dream. I had it consistently over and over and over again, the dream mm. about Shelly. Interesting. And so <laughs> look at me now. Um, <laughs> Did you I, ever talk to Shelly in real life about any of this? I never spoke to Shelly again. I stayed away from her. She scared me. Um, right. <laughs> um, but but Shelly had a profound impact on me because that could have been my dream could have been a nightmare. Right. But Mm -hmm. instead, in the dream, it was me understanding that Shelly needed help. Right. Okay. Right. And so now I coach executives, I coach leaders, Mm -hmm. people who I know I can see need help. Right. And do most of them come to you or do you, or they find you, I guess? Like how well, do you, yeah. So how do people find me? They hear me on a, on a show like this, or mm-hmm. I do a lot of public speaking to different groups, at yeah. conferences, uh, entrepreneurs, leadership groups, or leadership conferences and events. Right. Or we get referrals. So when we deliver amazing coaching mm-hmm. with our clients, normally they say you need to coach my wife my daughter my son my <laughs> right. my my everybody brother <laughs> all the people who work in the company you just need to coach everybody yeah well that's actually really good i mean um so what would you say of all the people you had maybe not all but a good portion what was the similarity that they issue that they all had that why they really needed coaching Yeah. So we've been coaching leaders. I have a team of coaches Mm -hmm. and we've been coaching these kinds of people. We call them the highly driven population Mm -hmm. for the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so over that span of time, what we discovered is that normally these leaders who come for coaching tend to struggle in one of four areas. And it's pretty consistent across the board. So the first thing is they feel a sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. So they have a huge burden of responsibility. They have a lot that they have to do, but they carry that responsibility on their shoulders and they feel like they carry it alone. Mm -hmm. And yes, they have people they delegate to, but at the end of the day, the buck stops here. And the issue is that they have so much going on in their brains, positive and negative. They Mm -hmm. don't have any place to deposit it where they feel that they can trust the person. Right. Right. So they just feel alone in it and there's Mm -hmm. not a lot of places where they can go and unload. So that's thing. Number one, isolation. Number two is that they are people who have a sense of chronic dissatisfaction. So they are high achievers. They've done a lot, but they're not satisfied. Right. They think that they're behind. They don't understand why things take so long. They don't understand why why things aren't moving so quickly. They don't understand what's wrong with them. They don't understand why the guy next to them does things better, faster. Mm -hmm. So they feel like they're at a disadvantage and they don't feel like they are where they should be. And they feel like there's something fundamentally wrong and they, they can't figure out what that is. Right. They always want more. They always want more out of life. Mm -hmm. The third thing is that they have 
uh, what I would call friction with others. And that could be, let's call it overt friction or covert friction. Okay. So overtly, they fight with people. They get into battles, right? They have aggressiveness. They, you Mm. know, they want things. And so it comes out and it comes out sometimes not so kindly or nicely. (laughs) And so that creates friction. But more often than not, there's what I would call covert friction, where they have a team. Perhaps the team isn't working fast enough. Perhaps Mm -hmm. their quality levels aren't the same, but they're not meeting expectations. And so as leaders, what we see is they notice this gap, but they have so much going on. They don't always address the gap. And so they feel this sense of frustration, this friction that they never voice. They never speak. And right. so they keep it in silently and mm-hmm. inside what, ex- what they experience is a sense of seething. They just boil mm-hmm. up on the inside. Okay. And then the fourth thing that we see is a term that I invented. It's called slippage. And what is slippage? It's when leaders let really important things slip through the cracks, mm-hmm. their relationships, their health, their sleep, their fun. They're not eating well. Maybe they're drinking too much. They're working long, long hours and they're not doing much of anything else. They're not having a lot of fun in life. That's for sure. And so they're letting, in a way, the important parts of life slip through the cracks. That's very interesting. And do you, when you talk to these people, do you delve into kind of like what their childhood was like or their younger years were like? Do you get to that? Yeah. So one of the things that we do when we coach our our highly highly driven and executives Mm -hmm. is that we ask them to journal in a private and secure online journal every single day for the duration of their coaching period. And as they're journaling, what we're really doing is we're taking them through a journey Mm -hmm. that allows us to explore what's happening now, what's causing you frustration, pain, Mm -hmm. dissonance, whatever it is. Yeah. What happened in the past? How does that past play a role in the present? Right. And then what do you want for the future? And so we mm-hmm. definitely go into childhood. Right. And the reason we do that is just to understand how their past influences the way they are now. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. some people carry their past on, right? They carry their past and they right. hold tight onto it and as though it still exists today. <laughs> yes. Yes. I completely understand that. Um, and so are they usually pretty honest when they are, you know, journaling in here? Because you see the journal, I assume, and then yes. you go over it with them. Do, are, do you find that they are very self-aware about the things that have happened to them and honest about, you know, what their part in how they ended up where they are? Is you know, what That's I mean? a great question. So let, let me kind of explain to you how it works. Mm-hmm. So let's say I was coaching you. You okay. would journal. Mm-hmm. So let me go back. On a weekly basis, you would receive a journaling prompt, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say it's Monday, you would receive a journaling prompt and you would start journaling. And every time you journal, your coach would be reading and responding to your journal every Mm -hmm. single day by asking you questions, going deeper, understanding what Mm -hmm. happened, what, you know, so it's not the client's job to really, as they're journaling, they self-reflect, but the, the client's job isn't to say, oh, and this was my role, right? Right. It's the coach's job to take them through a process where the client has a realization of mm. their role, if that right. makes any sense. Yes. So when you ask, are they honest? They are honest about their interpretation of things that are going on <laughs> around them. Right. And that's all I need. Yeah. Right. Because, yeah. because you live your life through your lens. That's true. Right. So they are truthful about the way they see what's happening, Mm -hmm. how they think about what's happening, what they believe to be true about what's happening. And my job is to unearth what they believe to be true and help them decide whether or not those beliefs match with their desires and goals. Mm. So when you ask the question, are they truthful? What is truth, right? Truth is, truth is a little bit abstract anyways. Right. Right. So they are truthful according to them. And that's all I need them to be. Right. I mean, I, I asked because I had people in mind when I was thinking about that, about their life has gone and, and things like that. And I find that there's a lot of people who don't, I mean, 
perception is someone's truth, right? Whatever they perceive to be true is what it is at the time. And that could be, you, you could have been there and you could have had a totally different perception of what happened. And so, you know, I, I think that there's, depending on where a person has been in life and all the things that have happened to them, their perception of what's reality and what isn't can shift and change in any moment. Like it's like, oh, the sky's blue. No, it's not. Uh, okay. You know, <laughs> you're not right. going to argue with somebody who's, because why? If, that, if that's what they think it is. Okay. You just go on down the street with that, sir. That's good. Bye. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, like, but, but, but people have beliefs that yeah. serve them. And people right. have beliefs that don't serve them. Of course. <laughs> right. So, so my job is to say, okay, so here's your belief. Right. Does it help you get to where you want to go? True. Right. Does it line up or does it actually slow you down? Yeah. Right. So yeah. that, that's my job is to help mm -hmm. them make decisions about how they think and whether or not their thinking will allow them to easily get to where they want to go. Right. And I would imagine that there could be some pushback in that initially, maybe. Usually there isn't, to, to no. be honest, because they are supplying the data. Right. Right. They are saying, here's what happened. Mm -hmm. Right. They're giving me all the information. <laughs> and when they tell me, here's what happened, I ask more questions. And they're right. like, yeah, but it's more like this. Right. Yeah. And they give me all this information. So yeah. they give it to me. Yeah. And then I say, okay, let's look at what you wrote here. Right. Right. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I wrote that. Yeah. Right. So like, there's no denying here. Yes. There's no, and, and what's really important is that our clients understand we are on their side. Yes. We want to help them reach their goals. Right. So there's not a whole lot of pushback per okay. se. That's what good. there is, is like this almost relief that somebody sees them clearly mm -hmm. for once in their lives. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure that's really rewarding <laughs> if you're able to, I, I guess too, my thought about that is, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with landmark education. Very much so. Like so, yeah. you know, there's always what happens and the story about what happened <laughs> and people living out of the story of what happened and not what actually happened. Per Correct. Se. So, you know, there's always a thing of getting to what happened and then, you know, so it's good that when people are able to I guess, reflect on it and then have someone who has nothing to do with it, like weren't there, don't, don't know you, don't know you from, you know, hole in the wall, be able to come and say, oh, okay, well then, and just not non-judgmentally ask, how's this working for you <laughs> or whatever, you know? Exactly. So, exactly that. Because that's, but yes, when somebody is, themselves. <laughs> right. But when somebody's journaling, what are they doing? They're writing down their story. Right. And when you have a good coach who knows how to read what they've written and then drill in and get to the meat of the matter, to the, mm -hmm. to the heart, to the core, now you have magic. Yeah, that's true. So what qualifications would one have to have to do what you do? I mean, it sounds like it can be very, it's interesting work for sure. And then yeah, I, I mean, like, there's got to be some good, you have to be like a lot of things to be able to work with people in this way. Yeah, you know, like for me, I think that I just had an instinct for it mm -hmm. since I was a kid. It was like part of my DNA, part of my nature. Mm -hmm. well, you have so many different coaches out there. And I think, you know, one of our key distinguishing factors is we are using journaling. We get mm -hmm. to know, know our clients extremely well. Like imagine I'm reading your journal every single day, but not only am I reading it, I'm interacting with you right. through this journal. So one of the things that I really feel strongly about is a lot of coaches try to coach individuals without knowing them well enough to do that. Right. But when, when I'm reading your journals day in and day out, I understand how you operate. I understand mm -hmm. how you think. I understand your patterns of thought, your behaviors, your, your beliefs, like what's important to you, all of that, right? Mm -hmm. Your values. And yeah. I get to see a lot more of you than a typical or traditional coach. Can right. any other coach use journaling? Of course. In fact, yeah. I'm teaching a course uh, in September called journal based coaching, hmm. where other people can learn how to use a journal in their coaching process. Right. But, you know, there's so many coaches out there. Are we all made the same? I don't no. think so. Not at all. Not at all. No. Um, and what, what, what job did you have before you got to this? I mean, you were, you always had the thought in your head that you were going to do this or you were doing it, but did you have other jobs before this? Like I don't think I had the thought that I was going to do this. 
but I was always fascinated with leaders and how they operate. So prior to this, I used to own a software company and we used to build simulation based assessments. And the purpose of those assessments was to help companies make better hiring decisions. Now mm -hmm. keep in mind, like that was 30 years ago when mm -hmm. simulations weren't even a thing. Now they're very common, but at right. the time, like we were on the leading edge of technology. And if you look back, it was like not even anything, right? But mm -hmm. at the time it was like, we we're really, really cool developing very cool systems. Yeah. And what we discovered was that if we looked at how people reacted and responded to these simulations mm -hmm. and compared it with their actual performance, we discovered that top performers have something in common. And that's that thing that they have in common uh, will determine their level of success regardless of the position they're in, regardless of the industry they're in, regardless of their years of experience or their education. Right. And so that became part of the background for the company I have now, Frame of right. Mind Coaching. Mm -hmm. So what, what is that thing? It's that if people have a high degree of emotional resilience, they will be substantially more likely to succeed than other people. Mm -hmm. So now how do you build emotional resilience? Like, is that something that you're just born with? Or is that something that you can kind of build, acquire over time? Right. Right. Hmm. And it's, it's similar to having great abs. Some people naturally <laughs> have great abs, right? right? But Guilty. other people need to go to the to go, need to go to the gym to build up their abs. So yeah. it's the same concept. This is also a muscle, yeah. emotional resilience that you build. And so can you build up your emotional resilience? Of course, that's what we do with our clients all day and all night. Mm -hmm. And do you use that kind of, you said it's like the foundation, but do you use an assessment similar to that when you're working with people? Or Well, we use, we use a, an assessment not to assess performance, right. but to, to assess how somebody is feeling about the different things going on in their lives. Like right. how satisfied are they? And we're yeah. looking at those four areas, right? Yeah. Isolation, chronic dissatisfaction, their relationships with others or their level of friction with others, and then their slippage. So we're assessing those four areas. Hmm. Nice. And so what does, what's the process? Like someone comes in and then like, how long do they work with you? Or is it like a set time or? Yeah. Great, great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, we we work with clients because they are typically executives, leaders. Mm -hmm. They like speed. They want results quickly. And right. so what we do is we front load our coaching so mm -hmm. that we give them initially 10 very, very intense weeks. Okay. And those 10 weeks are designed to move someone a great distance in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So normally they talk to me. I assign them to a coach. Then they have an orientation call with that coach. And mm -hmm. then they start coaching right away they start journaling every day and then they have their first call so they have a call every week mm -hmm. every call is recorded so that they could listen to the recordings and hear the stories they're telling and mm -hmm. hear how they're showing up right right and get a double dose of coaching and then in between every call we're asking them to journal with their coach every single day no days off no weekends no vacations right and their coach is with them by their side every single day of those 10 weeks hmm. so it's a very intimate and intense experience again it's designed to move someone far in a short period of time right after the 10 weeks many people stay on mm -hmm. but less intensely right so now they're like yeah i still need a call maybe once every two weeks mm -hmm. maybe once a month right and they continue to journal on an ongoing basis so like maintenance, basically kind like of. maintenance exactly exactly but those 10 weeks are literally life-changing they're transformational mm -hmm. for people nice and my thought is okay without revealing someone's you know who, a person specifically what's one person you can think of that had like the most extraordinary results that you're just really happy like it, it really <laughs> blew you away i'll tell you the story because it's like also relevant this week okay, okay. So, um, I was introduced to this, uh, I, I was, I was working with a client and he said, I want you to coach a friend of mine, uh, mm -hmm. but I want you to make sure that you treat him with kid gloves. Okay. And I thought that that was really weird because I'm really direct when I coach. So mm -hmm. there are no gloves, right? Like just no gloves, right? Gloves come off. 
just it is what it is sir. it is what it is and i said well ex- like why would you say that yeah. and he said well it's because he's in his early 30s and he has stage four cancer Ooh. i said okay i got on the phone with him and i said i have two questions to ask mm-hmm. number one is how long do you have left to live right and he said i don't know i'm on all these experimental drugs i think i've already outlived my time but if I had to guess, I think I have a two year window ahead of me. Mm. I said, okay, what is it that you want to achieve as a result of coaching? What do you want my help with? Mm-hmm. He said, what I really, really want is I want you to help me increase my productivity. Mm. And I thought that was really strange, right? Like if I had two years left to live, would I be worried about my productivity? No. <laughs> no. So I said, well, why is that important to you? He said, well, I'm a, a single child of a mom who raised me alone Mm. and I want to grow my business and sell it so that I have enough money to leave her in a good spot. Oh, wow. Okay. I Mm. said, okay, let me ask you another question. What do you really, really want? Mm -hmm. I said, I want more time and I want to grow my business and I want to sell it and I want to run a marathon and I want to buy a home and I want to have a great relationship Mm. and I want to take my mom on two vacations and I, and I, and I want to, I want, I just want to do all these things. I said, let's do that. Let's work on that instead. Exactly. And when we started to work, when we started to work together, what I discovered is as the owner of his company, he was responsible for everything. You know, every deal that came in, he had to make sure he got the deal. Every deal that went out, he had to make sure that he had his eyes on it. And I said, listen, you can't continue doing things like this. Mm -hmm. You're stressing yourself out. My job is to help you reduce your stress so that these experimental drugs have a fighting chance. And I said, you need to think about hiring people. He said, I can't afford to hire anyone. I said, dude, you can't afford not to hire anyone. Your life is at stake. Right. But what we did was we looked at his beliefs and showed him how he could, in fact, start hiring people. Mm -hmm. And he started to hire people and he started to offload a lot of the things he was working on, gave himself more space and time. And now eight years later, let me tell you what's happened in those eight years. Oh, he's still alive. He still has stage four cancer. Oh, okay. He, um, sold his business, half his, half of his business. Mm -hmm. Um, he took his mom on two great vacations. Mm -hmm. He bought a house. Nice. He renovated the house. He ran a marathon, but then he also ran a triathlon and then climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Wow. And then he got married. Oh. And this week he had a baby. Oh, my goodness. Right. And that wouldn't have been possible without you. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I'll take full responsibility. Like, I think he, I didn't play much of a role in him having yeah. a baby. You no. know? <laughs> no. <laughs> but... Well, I mean, over the whole thing, because if you I, mean, I, I, I had a, right I, I had a role to play. Yeah. Right. I had a role to play. I wasn't responsible. He was responsible. True. Right. And you gave him the right questions in the beginning to ask, because like, right. there's some people that aren't going to know to do that. They're going to go and say, mm, OK, we want to work on your productivity. Let's do that if that's what they said. But you were intuitive enough to ask those things because otherwise you know clearly somebody who's in that level of having cancer they there's so much stress in their life that's the first thing you would assess right off the top it's like bro you need to like offload pretty much all, everything to let your body heal you're not you, you there's just that's not gonna work it's not sustainable clearly exactly so, you know exactly. what i mean like yeah. and a, a lot of people are not thinking about that they're just thinking oh i'm doing my job this is what he said he wanted so i'm going to give him that you know so yeah this week some credit ma'am yeah and this week he sent me a picture of him and his wife and his beautiful new son and so Uh that literally gave me goosebumps when i saw it that's amazing yeah like let's give you (laughs) something for that because you you. had something to do with that i mean he, he did it all i was like you know just by his side Right? Yeah. yeah, but you gave him the direction. Let's just say, let's give yourself some credit. <laughs> okay, so yes, um, but that's amazing, and you know, I'm sure there's some people who maybe take a little bit longer, or you know, there's there's all ranges when you're dealing with people because you know, again, like you said, there he did a lot of the work, but then there's some people who are not going to do the work because 
whatever reason. So like when you come across somebody like that, how does, how well, do you feel the thing that? is that when somebody comes to me, they know how I operate. They know what I need. Right. They know what I'm expected. Uh, I'm expecting from them. Right. And so typically they come in prepared to do the work, okay. but they also come in understanding one very important thing. And, and I think this is really crucial. Mm -hmm. If you think about your life, Right? right. And you think about like, who really knows me backwards, forwards and inside out? Mm -hmm. You think, okay, maybe my husband, my wife, you know, my wife, if you're a man, whatever, right? Yeah. My spouse, let's call it that. My right. spouse, my children, but even, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. we keep things from them. Yeah. Sometimes we protect them. Sometimes we don't really want to expose them to our struggles, our challenges. Sometimes we keep those things to ourselves, but who out there in the world is going to spend that much time and energy really, really knowing who I am, how I think, how I operate, what's important to me, what hurts me, yeah. what frustrates me, who? The answer you. is nobody, nobody. <laughs> and so when they come to work with us, they understand that we're in, imagine it's a boat, right? We're in right. a boat together and we're both rowing. Right. And they understand that as a coach, I'm rowing just as hard as you. Okay day in and day out. Let's go. Let's row. Let's row. Let's row. <laughs> right. Yeah. So when they understand what they're getting themselves into and who they're doing it with, mm -hmm. they're prepared to do the work. Okay. Great. That makes sense. I'm just a little bit passionate, right? I, no, it's good. <laughs> I mean, cause it's not like work then if, if you're passionate about what you do, you know, hundred percent. And you got that way for a reason, you know, <laughs> obviously everything that happened in your life led you to that, you know, yeah. where you're able to help people in that way. And I think as it, what's the saying that says, uh, those who can't, those who do teach or something, something along those lines, like, you know, the things that you give are the things that you use the most for yourself, I think, or teach, you know, you taught that to yourself first before you could give it to anybody else. Yes. I've been doing this a long time. I'm a yeah. veteran in the coaching industry. <laughs> <laughs> so are, did you go to school for this? Were you certified? Like, how did you get to be? This yeah, good question. I, I, um, I have an undergraduate degree in psychology. Okay. I have a master's degree in business. Mm -hmm. I never actually went to coaching school, but I have a lot of experience at this point. Right. And now we teach other people how to become coaches and we certify them. Nice. So you're giving back to the world again. <laughs> so where do you see yourself in your business in, I don't know, five, 10 years? What's next for you? I'll tell you, I, I have a, a philosophy and the philosophy is that I think coaches in the world would mm -hmm. do a much better job if they engaged with journaling, right? Mm -hmm. With their clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so right now I'm on a mission to teach coaches in the world how to use a journal in their coaching process. So okay. I'm teaching a course called journal based coaching mm -hmm. for any coach, any coach out there, whether mm -hmm. they're certified with ICF or anywhere else, EMCC or anywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't mm -hmm. really matter yeah. um, how to read, how to work with a journal and their clients. Mm -hmm. my, my feeling is that in five years from now, it will be much more of a standard in the industry. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to leave my mark on the industry. And then I have other things I'm doing. Like okay. my husband and I wrote three kids books. Oh, cool. So um, right now I'm looking for a publisher, but nice. we are, you know, I have other things that I want to do. I want to have mm -hmm. grandchildren. I want to, mm -hmm. you know, want to do things, life things. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, you got to take care of those too. <laughs> so I think like, so. I think the, so. What's the top three things that you want to do next? What I want to do next. Yeah. Uh, I what's want to. The that you want to yeah. Do? Honestly, this next year, I want to train 200 new coaches mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. journal based coaching. So that's thing. Number one thing. Number two is I, we wrote three books about a little girl named whimsical, Kimsical, mm -hmm. curly hair, uh, 10 year old kid who gets into interesting situations. Right. Um, I'm looking for a publisher. So that's the plan is for that, okay. that series to go 
live and into bookstores this next year. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is my husband and I really love traveling and Mm -hmm. doing things together. We went to Japan this year and next year we haven't decided yet, but another great adventure awaits. Great. So tell me, uh, let's see, what some shows that you're watching or books that you've read recently that have made an impact on your, on you? Uh, shows that we're watching. I just finished watching season three of the bear. Have you watched the bear? I've heard of it, but I haven't. No, I haven't watched it. Okay. So everybody needs to watch the bear. (laughs) Um, it won all these awards. Um, and it's, uh, it's just incredible television. Hmm. It's hard to explain like everything, some cinematography, storyline, dialogue, uh, no dialogue, the whole thing. It's just just remarkable Mm -hmm. in terms of a show so we we love that and then i like watching things like american idol and america's Mm -hmm. got talent just for like light fun entertainment right yeah and any books you've read that have made an impact on you well my cousin wrote a book called schlepping through the nile (laughs) and uh it's a series of short stories but what's interesting about that book is that there are some stories in that book about my family Mm -hmm. so uh definitely just reading about my mother and my father just always i i've read it more than once Hmm. and every time i read it it's like i've never read it before it's just it does something for me Hmm. that sounds super interesting yeah Hmm. what five words would you use to describe yourself today um curious Mm -hmm. passionate driven funny and uh inventive Mm, i would say impactful too thank you (laughs) so is there anything else that you have going on currently like how that we can support you on and how if somebody wants to get coached by you where do they need to go and what do they need um how do you find me frame of mind coaching.com i'm actually hosting a webinar in a shortly um and sharing information on journal-based coaching. So if you're listening and you're interested in learning how to use a journal in your coaching process, reach out because that's the thing I want to talk about right now. We can definitely put that as a link in the show notes. So if you want to email me that, then I'll definitely share that with everybody. Amazing. Thank you so much. So this was so impactful for me. I, I just find it so interesting to how people become as fabulous as they are and how they enjoy the things that they're doing. Because, you know, if you're not loving what you're doing, what are you doing? (laughs) I agree. (laughs) If it's not fun, I'm not doing it. (laughs) So any parting words you have for us, any, anywhere else people can find you on social media. Yeah. If, if anybody is a journaler and you're interested in some journaling prompts to practice with, to work on, Mm -hmm. um, on our website, frameofmindcoaching.com, you can download 10 powerful coaching uh, journaling prompts. And I just think even looking at those questions and asking yourself like, to think about, to reflect on these questions will have an amazing impact on every person. So do that. Yeah, I love that. Well, thank you so much for being with me today. I loved our conversation and we'll definitely have to have you back so we can find out what other fabulous things you're doing in the future. I love that. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It was wonderful chatting with you today. Thank you so much. And thank everybody for listening and tune in to another episode of Fabulous Women Over 40. Ciao, 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 ciao for now. Thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe so you won't miss our next Conscious Conversation with Kara and her fabulous guests. Follow Kara on social on Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, Clubhouse, at Kara Allen. And connect with her on her website at karaallen.com. Also, leave a review if you enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again, and see you next time.